So, we're going to talk about how did I get here. So, uh, we're going to look at this from maybe a different approach. We're going to look at different people in the Bible and where they were. And maybe they ask the question themselves, how did they get here? All right. This is Jonah. For your generation, uh, Jonah and the big fish. Right? How many of you guys saw that Veggie Tales? Mm, wow. Wow. I read it in the Bible. Anyway, so... <laughs> I know, that was, that was good, though. That was pretty good. We've been working it all night. All right, so Jonah swallowed by a big fish. Jonah swallowed by a big fish. So we're going to talk about how did Jonah get there? How did Jonah get in the belly of a big fish? What happened? Anybody? We denied Jesus. Denied Jesus. Run away from God, right? Jonah wanted to do his own thing. Now, Jonah is in this well, or in this big fish, the Bible necessarily says well, and it says this, and you might not be able to read this, unless you have glasses like me. Um, I called out to the Lord out of my distress, and he answered me out of the belly of shell. I cried, and you heard my voice, for you cast me to the deep, into the heart of the seas, and the flood surrounded me. All of your waves and all your billows passed over me, and then I said, I am driven away from your sight, yet I shall again look up to your holy temple. The waters closed in over me to take my life. The deep surrounded me. Weeds were wrapped around my head. At the roots of the mountains, I went down to the land whose bars closed up, closed upon me forever. Yet you brought up my life from the pit. O Lord my God, when my life was fainting away, I remembered the Lord. And my prayer came to you in your holy temple. Those who pay regard to vain idols forsake their hope of steadfast love. But I, with the voice of thanksgiving, will sacrifice to you what I have vowed. I will pay. Salvation belongs to the Lord. Now just imagine this. You are drowning. And this is what you pray out. He is going down to the desert of the soul. It's not like he was on, like, floating and saying, oh, Lord, my God. Right? He was drowning. And this big fish swallows him up. Now just think to yourself, how did he get there? Right? First thing, Jonah didn't like the Ninevites, right? He let his emotions dictate his obedience. There's two schools of thoughts. Either there was a, the prophecy pretty much said that the Ninevites were going to come and ruin the Jewish people. And the other take was they already did that, but this is why Jonah didn't want to go. He let his emotions dictate his obedience. Now that's never been us, right? You've never done that. Your emotions dictate if you obey God or not. Right, you just, you just obey God because you're a holy Christian. I know you are. I saw it in your Facebook status. Right? Jonah did not think, sorry, if you do Facebook still, Jonah did not think that the people were worthy of God's grace. He did. As a matter of fact, at the end in, in, Jonah, in chapter 4, Jonah is upset. I knew you were going to do this. Look at him. You let him live. Jonah's mad at God. And God's like, they don't know the right from their left. And you. You're like, you want me to destroy them? Right? Jonah wanted justice, not mercy. No justice for this person. No justice for these people. They deserve what they get. That's what Jonah wanted. Now, see, this leads me to question, who are your Ninevites? Right? For some of you, your Ninevites are Democrats. Because they don't know Jesus. Right? <laughs> oh! Right? For some of you, they're Republicans. Right? Because they're just a big elephant in the room. First, yeah, that sounds good. I know. Ha -ha. It's huge. Right? For some of you, it's black people. People of color. Why can't they just be more like us? We have morals and values. Why can't they just bring them on themselves? For some of us, it's white people. They're all racist. Every last one of them. Right? Only the people look like me are laughing, right? So, so some of us, we have little bites. For some of us, it's males. Male chauvinist. You're a male pig. You deserve what's coming to you. For some of you, it's women. If they didn't want to be treated like that, then why are they acting like that? Right? This is how we as Christians think. This is how we think sometimes. 
Listen, I had to get over my own biases when I came here. Thinking everybody who's white hates me. I don't even know them from a can of paint. Right? You, you got to get over that. And, and then we, see, we don't want to share the gospel with these kind of people because they deserve what they got. Immigrants? Psh. I'm all about keeping everybody out of here. Right? It, it, it's because we don't think. We're thinking how we feel. Our politics dictate our obedience. Our emotions dictate our obedience. How do we were raised in our family, the environment we were raised around, that dictates our obedience. And how did you get there? Your selfishness. And what's funny, I find God calling all of us to go to Ninevites. Did you know Jonah is the only successful prophet in the Bible? He's the only prophet that spoke and people actually listened. Everybody else kept doing their own thing. But when it comes to us, we want to do what we want. Who knows this guy, Daniel and the what? Oh, you saw that one. Ooh, ooh, Daniel was a prophet. You remember that from VeggieTales? That was the very first one, right? Right, yeah. I laughed because I had to watch it like 20 million times. Right? Daniel is thrown into the lion's den. Why is Daniel thrown into the lion's den? Anybody? Biblical scholars. Why is he thrown into the lion's den? Huh? He's not liked. He won't worship the king. He won't worship the king. The king made a decree based on people who didn't like Daniel. Say, hey, listen, king, if anybody prays to anybody but you for the next 30 days, throw them to the lions. Right? Now, this isn't like jail. This is actually death. So, Daniel heard that decree. He was saddened and he went to go pray. They got him, threw him into the lion's den. The king was tormented day and night. He, he, he just couldn't get over it. He, he walked back and forth. And then we get to Daniel chapter 6, verse 19 and 23. It says, Then at the break of day, the king arose and went into haste to the den of lions. As he came near to the den where Daniel was, he cried out in a tone of anguish. The king declared to Daniel, Oh, Daniel, servant of the living God, has your God who you serve continually been able to deliver you from the lions? Then Daniel said to the king, O king, live forever. My God says this angel and shut the lion's mouth and we have pizza and they have not harmed me. That's not in there. <laughs> because I was found blameless before him and also before you, O king, I have done no harm. Then the king was exceedingly glad and commanded that Daniel be taken out of the den. So Daniel was taken up out of the den and no kind of harm was found on him because he had trusted in his God. And the guys who threw him in there, it's okay, it's just a baby. The guys who threw him in there, they got eaten up. Right? So now let's look at Daniel. Daniel followed God no matter the cost. That's how he got to the lion's den. Daniel was not bitter though, right? He was happy. We're good. Angel came last night, shut this lion up. I've just been sitting here. Thank you for opening the den. I'm a little bit hungry. Right? Daniel trusted God and he wasn't bitter about it, right? Now listen, how did Daniel get here? Daniel got here because this is obedience. See, Jonah's identity was wrapped up in who Jonah was. It was all wrapped up in him. Daniel's identity was wrapped up in God and God alone. Daniel had no clue that God was going to shut the lion's mouth. He probably thought, I'm about to die. Oh well, at least I prayed before I died. Right? His identity was wrapped in God and he was fine. So he got there because of obedience. What's your lines, dear? Where has God placed you that is not the most comfortable? I don't think Daniel was like, oh, it's just lines. It's all right. We can go to sleep. And if I was Daniel, I'm up all night. Not that I don't trust God, but just in case something happens, I'm going to be ready. Right? So where has God placed you that's really uncomfortable? And he's telling you to trust me because your identity is wrapped up in me. So trust me. But God, I don't like it here. Okay, trust me. But God, this, this is not right. Trust me. Right? When's the last time you've been in some place that's uncomfortable and you have been bitter at God? God, when are you going to get me out of here? Guys, it's almost over now. Oh, God, please. You know, it's funny. People can't wait to get out of high school, but then they want to go right back. People can't wait. I can't wait to leave Estherville. And they didn't want to. Now, I know what you're saying. I don't want to go back to high school. Wait till you're like 30. 
and you start dreaming about what you, you could have done in high school. I could have made that great play. That should have been me up there. Do, 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 do. But no, it was Susie. <laughs> I don't know who Susie is. Who? Susie. Marsha, Marsha, Marsha. All right, now. <laughs> you guys know the Brady Bunch? You must have saw the movie. You didn't actually see the reruns like I did. Or the TV movies. All right, Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar. Does anybody know who this guy is? What? Nebuchadnezzar. He's a king. He's a king. Rat Shack and Benny. Does that sound familiar? The bunny, the bunny. Oh, look, you, I see, yeah. You, you got it on your iPhone, don't you? Yeah, I know. All right, Nebuchadnezzar, right? This is the guy who was like, you know, he saw the fiery furnace, but this is also the guy who went to the, the top of all his kingdom, surveyed the land, and said, boy, look at me. I am the best thing ever happened. You know, look what I've done. And then he looked up into the sun and went crazy. I mean crazy. His, his fingernails grew real long. His hair grew long. He ate like an animal. Lived in the animal. Lived in the garden of the kingdom like an animal for seven years. But God warned him, that's going to happen to you since you won't give me praise. Nebuchadnezzar identified with what he had. Right? That's not any of us though, right? We don't identify with what we have. We just have the latest iPhone. Oh, the, the iPhone 10, they're not making it anymore? I need the iPhone 10 Plus. It does so much more. It really doesn't. It's just bigger. I need a bigger screen so I can zombie out and lose my brain again. I need that, right? Now, this is what, it ha this is what happened in, in three verses. At the end of the days, I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted my eyes to heaven, my reason returned to me, and I blessed the Most High and praised and honored him who lives forever. For his dominion is an everlasting dominion, and his kingdom endures from generation to generation. All the inhabitants of the earth are accounted as nothing, and he does, not, he does according to his will among the hosts of the heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth. And none can say his hand or say to him, to say his hand or say to him, what, you have, what have you done? At the same time, my reason returned to me, and for the glory of my kingdom, my majesty and splendor returned to me. My counselors and my Lord sought me, and I was established in my kingdom, and still more greatness was added to me. Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and extol and extol, exalt, extol, and honor the king of heaven. For all his works are right, and for his ways are just. And those who walk in, his pride, walk in pride, he is able to humble. Nezi was prideful. He was prideful about what he had. Like, you know what's funny? When you come to college, you're not the, the star athlete anymore. There are like 25 of you. Right? You're not the most handsome guy in school anymore. There's some more handsome guys. You're not the prettiest girl or the smartest girl anymore. Now someone else is just as smart. Doesn't matter if you go to community college or a big university, there's someone who's always better. It's, it's not about you anymore. So pride begins to fleet because I, what, what's my thing? What's my niche? Right? How many of you guys are great athletes in high school? Guess what? After you graduate college, unless you're a professional, it's over. You're not going to go to the accounting firm talking about something. When's the track team start? It's not going to happen. Nebuchadnezzar was really not a believer. And how did God bring it to himself? Humbled him. You may not be a believer. And God may be humbling you. I'm supposed to go to ISU. I'm supposed to be a cyclone. I'm a, I'm a Laker. Humility. I, I'm supposed to get all these scholarships. People in my high school are going to be looking at me. I was voted most successful in my high school. And I'm going to a community college. Humility. The guy beat me. He started and I'm not. I was a state champion. Humility. I can't do this anymore. I can't play a sport anymore. It's over for me. Humility. But he learned one thing. God's will is absolute. And he trusted God. He learned that his will is absolute. God has a greater purpose than for you to be famous. Than for you to have your name over. The, Hi. It's all about me. Selfie time. <laughs> 
It's a laugh because some of you do the duck face probably. So your profile picture, right? But here's the thing though, it's not about you. Right now, here's the question I have for you then. How did you get here? Your pride. Because your identity is wrapped up in who you were or who you think you are. Is your pride leading to your fall? Can you hear it? It's like you're a, a tree in the forest and you just hear that, you hear that axe every day. It's grinding, just going and going. And you know you're coming to a fall because you can't keep up this facade anymore. Who's this guy? Who's his brother? Nah, the Undertaker. Anybody? Anybody? You get it? Okay, heathen, WWE. Okay, all right. Just playing. I grew up with Cain and Undertaker. Cain and Abel. Cain and Abel. What happened with these two? Huh? Yes. Monkey stumped him in the ground with the rock. He was the original rock. Smell what was cooking. That's kind of mean. This guy died. It's kind of messed up. All right. Now, so here's the thing. God said make a sacrifice. Cain and Abel bring a sacrifice. Abel brings the best food of all time. I mean, he's got it. The first fruits just laid out. Here you go, God. Take my stuff. Here's a sacrifice to you. Cain just kind of goes in the ark and his garden, grabs some stuff, and ugh. Woo! That's for you, God. God sees Abel's sacrifice and he says, yes. He sees Cain's and, okay, I accept this one though. What does Cain do? He gets upset. The Lord said to Cain, why are you so angry? Why is your face fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin is crouching at the door. It is, it is desires for you, but you must rule over it. Cain was jealous. His identity was being better than his brother. Right? We don't have that problem as Christians, though, right? We're not trying to be better than somebody else. Cain did not give the Lord his best because his identity was only being better than his brother. He thought he was better than his brother. He was wrong. Cain saw Abel as a rival, not as a brother. Now, none of us, our identities aren't wrapped up in that in your families, right? Trying to be better than your sibling. Show them that you, you can do this better than they can. Trying to get your parents' attention. Grown men, grown women still trying to vie for mommy and daddy's attention. Look at me, mommy. I got straight A's. Look at me, mommy. We have three kids, not four. Look at me, mommy. We got two dogs. They only have one. <laughs> we laugh, but it's true. Right? We, we, and, and this carries over in our relationships in school. It's a rivalry. Somebody gets engaged. I'm getting engaged next. Well, we weren't talking about you, though. Somebody thinks someone else looks... Why do you think she looks cute? I look cute, but I just said... She, I, I thought we were talking about her. I didn't know we were talking about you. You're in the weight room. Ah, ah, uh, uh, uh. You're going to... You know, I'm about to get... Just... Bah, about to just blow your whole stomach up. Because I got to prove I'm stronger than him. For what? Is it a contest? Do we get paid in the end? No. Okay, then. I'm putting these weights down. Good job. Scream all you want, bro. I'm sorry, you guys are wrestlers, so you could probably doing that all day, huh? Oh, look at me. I'm 131 and a half. <laughs> it's kind of messed up. I'm 140, though. Anyway, but the point is this. We're not rivals in the body of Christ. But we have uh, 500 people at our church. You only have 100. Our worship's better than your worship. My pastor is funnier than your pastor. My pastor looks better than your pastor. Our, we're Baptists. you Catholic. <laughs> right? We rival one another. And that's not how God has called us to be. So the question is, if your identity is wrapped up with being better than someone else, who is your able? That you're so focused on beating somebody else. You, you look at the political spectrum of America, that's the problem right there. We're better because, we're, we're wiser because. You look at any kind of ism, whether it's sexism, racism, or ageism, we're better because of this. We're rivals. It, it makes me laugh when I see college kids make fun of their professors because they think they're old. I can't wait till they get old. It's not going to be as funny anymore. 
I know how I treated my college professors. I, I, I wanted to be respectful. Sometimes they cracked me up. And then you become the old guy in the room. And people want to snicker at you when you're looking at their tight pants. Get some real pants, dude. All right. <laughs> Sorry. And they got tight jeans on today. All right. David. How many of you guys know anything about David? Hmm? Not Goliath. Not this one. That was too easy. David's looking over his palace. He's supposed to be at war, but he's looking over his palace. And back in the day, you, you had your baths on top of your houses because you collect the rainwater. But it was, you had this wall built up so no one can see you from the bottom. But if you had a high, mighty palace, you can always look down on people. What was David looking at or who was he looking at? Bathsheba taking a bath. Ha ha. Ding, ding, ding. That's what he was looking at. Looking at Bathsheba taking a bath, and he saw what he liked. He took one peek. Now I shouldn't do this. <laughs> Lord, forgive me. My eyes. Ah, oh, skip it. Right? That's what he did. He looked at Bathsheba. He brought her to her house. David's king. He sleeps with Bathsheba. He has sex. Now listen. I know what we think. Well, Bathsheba was willing. No, she wasn't. The king said, come over. The king said, we're about to have sex. What do you think he did? He assaulted her. She probably didn't want to even be there. But who's going to tell the king no? She gets pregnant. She tells David, I'm late. And David's like, to dinner? No. Nope. <laughs> you like that joke, right? Yeah, I know. <laughs> My wife told me that. I'm late, Joe, for what? Oh, we're ready, yay! More money! <laughs> no, I love my kids. I, I love them. <laughs> right. So anyway, she tells him you're late, and David says, don't worry about it. Go home. I got you. I'm going to take care of you. He shames her, sends her home, calls her husband in from war, gets them all liquored up, sends her home, says, hey, man, go home. Be with your wife. Lady, your wife. Do it. It's on me. You got it. He wakes up the next morning that she was husband is laying on the welcome mat, and David's like, dude, why didn't you go home and sleep with your wife and get her pregnant? He said, everybody else is out in the field, sir. I'm not going to do that. I'm going I'm to resist just like them. So David sends him out, calls his best friend Joab, say, hey, man, this dude needs to go to the front line. Joab's like, he'll die. Hey, man, this dude needs to go to the front line. I know, I need him to die. So people don't know my shame. Uriah dies, he's dead. And David takes Bathsheba as his wife. Nathan the prophet kicks open the door, tells David the story about, you know, a lamb was a, like a, it was a precious little thing and it was like a pet to a family. This other guy saw it, he took it and he ate it. But he had hundreds of lambs. David felt horrible about that and he told him he was right. David writes Psalms 51. This is my favorite verse from Psalms 51, verse 10. If, if not my favorite verse in the Bible, Create in me a clean heart, O oh God, and renew a, stead, a, a right spirit, a steadfast spirit within me. How did David get here? David let sexual arousal rule him. That's how he got there. He saw something that he liked. He shouldn't have been there. He should have been doing something else, but he kept looking. And he let it rule him. His identity was in his arousal now. He wasn't where he should have been. And he, he didn't look away. Right? Every person who's been caught in some sexual sin got caught in the first time because they just couldn't. Well, she looks really nice tonight. Hope she's on my team. Oh, she bumped into me. Oh, don't worry about it, girl. We're good. Or if you like me, hey, Joe, come give me a hug. Sure. Boy, thanks for massaging my back and my front and my chest. Right? You let it rule you. You look on the computer, you can't get enough of what you're looking at, so you keep looking. You're supposed to be doing your work. You say you're going to read the Bible. You said you're going to study, but you keep looking and looking. You start on Yahoo. You go to Yahoo to Instagram. Go to Instagram. Next thing you know, you're on every freaking site there is, and it's getting, you got to have some strange things pop up now because nothing's enough. You can't, it, it's just, it's too much. And then finally you give in. And you do whatever sexual sin that you want. And you hope that no one finds out. Because you're identified with it. You're saying this is who I am. And that's not what God's saying. 
Everybody in this room has a Bathsheba. Everyone does. Everybody in this room has something that pulls at them, that calls to them to do something sexually inappropriate. And you got to fight that stuff because it's real. It leads to assault. It leads to craziness. Listen, I've been on the side where I've been in college, the girl's drunk, and hey, you want to kiss? No, I'm drunk. Oh, okay, okay. But let me tell you about Jesus. And I've been on the other side where I've just been touched inappropriately by a woman because it, it stopped touching me. I just want one more. It leads to craziness like this. And that's not what God has called us to. We're not to identify with our sexual arousal. I understand you want to have sex. Just wait till you're married. It's a precious thing. And just because you're married doesn't mean it goes away. You still got to fight that stuff. But when you're married, man, you can have sex all the time. If you're awake. I'm awake all the time. <laughs> Baby, you're awake? Yeah, I am. What you need? You need something? No, okay, good. All right. I just want to know. You're laughing. I know. You're just hold on there. All right. Peter. How many of you guys know Peter? Walking on water and falling in, right? He was the first guy just to, Jesus, help me, help me, right? He's also the guy that said, you're the Christ. And Jesus is like, yes, Peter, that's awesome. And I'm going to die for the sins of the world. Not on my watch, Jesus. Get thee behind me, Satan, right? He's also that guy. He's also the guy that, you know, yeah, he cut someone's ear off, but he's trying to take a neck off. He was just going to kill them all. Peter, no. He's also the guy, I'll never leave you, Lord. You're going to deny me like, you know, three times for the rooster crows. Before the day starts, Peter, you're going to say you don't know me. Never I. That's Peter. After all that, Peter just went back to work after Jesus was crucified. He just went back to a fisherman. He was done. It's over. My hope is dead. Right? Because Jesus, you know, Peter couldn't understand that Jesus was the Messiah. Peter wanted Jesus to be there forever in the way he wanted, right? He didn't identify with God's will. He identified with his own will. And he pressed Jesus for that. And Jesus didn't deliver. Right? You ever had that problem? Jesus didn't deliver the way he was supposed to. You had some expectations, didn't you? You had some dreams. And Jesus said, not this way. I got a different way. But Lord, this is me. <laughs> Look at me. Peter's expectations were dashed. Jesus is resurrected. They say, Peter, that's the Lord on the beach there, man. And, and Peter looks up, jumps into the water, swims a football field, jumps out and... And yes, that's little Eastern Jesus in the Middle East, right? So he hugs Jesus and then like, oh man! And, and Jesus says, Peter, do you love me? And Yes, feed my lambs. Peter, do you love me? Yes, tend my sheep. Peter, do you love me? Lord, why are you asking? You know I do. Then feed my sheep. And by the way, you're going to die a horrible death for my sake, but I want you to follow me. And Peter did from that day on. Jesus is essentially telling Peter, listen, go do the work, Peter. Right? Peter identified with his own will, but now he was identifying with God's will, whatever that was. There were no questions. There, were, there was no hesitation. Now I'm all in. What did Peter need? He needs to be restored. He needs to know, this is where you were, and I'm bringing you back. Imagine you have an A in a class, and you start to flunk, and you have an F. And your teacher comes in, and they sit down with each other. The professor looks in your eye and says, you have an F. I'm bringing you back up to an A. Why? Because I, I'm going to take your F. You have an A in my class now. Now, I want you to go and teach it. I'm not smart enough. I said go and teach it. I'm an idiot. Go and teach the class. I took your F. Peter needed to know it wasn't over. Have you ever felt like that with you and God? It's over. You've done too much. You, you said too many lies. It's all falling apart. You made too many mistakes. And this one wasn't even your fault. But man, it's over. I can't do this anymore. And sometimes you need to know it's not over. I still have a plan. Now get back in there. 
Peter had to be reminded that he was still loved. How many ever needed that from Jesus? Right? You, you sin, and the next day you just, <laughs> oh God, I'm such a horrible person. And God's like, I still love you. No, you don't know what I did. Yeah, I do. I, I love telling my kids, there's nothing you can do to make me stop loving you. Are you sure? Yes, but if you break that vase. <laughs> But right, here's the thing. Sometimes we need to be reminded that we are loved. Your sin speaks volumes, right? Because you know what you did. You know what you did before you came here. You know what you did on the ride over here. You know what you did yesterday night. You know what you did. You know what you were planning to do. Now you're kind of feeling convicted after you leave. But listen, here's the thing. God still loves. So what is Jesus trying to tell you? Are you so wrapped up in your own will and doing your own thing that you forget that God is saying, no, come here? Are you so boggled down by your sin that you have identified with, your failures that you identify with, that you forgot? Listen, it's not that you weren't from the wins and losses. You weren't from the wins and the lessons. You got to progress. So what is Jesus honestly trying to tell you tonight? Are you identifying with your sin or are you going to identify with me? The great I am. Now the question is, but how do I do all this? This is a great talk, awesome, made me laugh, but how? I can't, man, I gotta make those bigger. All right, Matthew 5, 6. The first one, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. How many of you guys ever been hungry? How many of you have ever been hungry in college? Being hungry at home is different than being hungry in college. You're hungry at home, it's just gonna get some more stuff, right? Mom and dad paying for it, I'm good. You're hungry in college, it's like, okay, I don't know what I'm gonna do. Ramen noodles ain't doing it no more. I got the shakes and my blood pressure is through the roof, right? You just don't know. But if when you finally get that one home cooked good meal that you sit down and eat, you go, oh, oh, I'm going to let my bell down. Oh, there you go. Thank you, Lord. That's good. Ate myself into a coma, you know? It's, it's that you're satisfied, though. And this is what Jesus is saying. If you will hunger and thirst for what is righteous, for me, you will be satisfied. And you realize these things don't satisfy you. Your pride, your sin, your shame, your own will, they never satisfy, do they? If, if, if what you did satisfied, you wouldn't change your outfit so many times. You wouldn't look by the mirror at my... Yeah, that's it tonight. Yeah, I'm doing it tonight. Yeah, I look good. And then you go up by the mirror again like, what is this? This nose hair? Oh my goodness, right? You're not satisfied. And that's why you have so many different phones. Samsung Galaxy 800. You're not satisfied. There is no 800. Yes, you're right. You're not satisfied. But in Christ, you're satisfied. It is something to be content in Jesus, not care about anything else. When you're satisfied with Christ, it doesn't care where you go. It doesn't matter where he places you because you're, he's all you need. Listen, for my wife, I can live in a dumpster with Tamika. And I'll be just fine. As long as I got that woman with me. You can put me in a mansion with a beautiful model. And I'll be like, I want my Tamika though. I need that crazy girl. That's what I need. But she's beautiful. Gorgeous. All right, so, so I was recording that, so I'll make sure I say that loud. All right, Romans 12, 1, 2. Hey, make your body a living sacrifice. Have you ever seen a living sacrifice? You know what that means? That means you take yourself to the altar to die. You willingly give up yourself. No one is forcing you. No one is throwing you. So what Jesus is saying, ultimately, give me everything. Imagine if you put in all that intensity that you put in seeking other stuff, you put that into Jesus. Imagine if you make a determination, it's not about I didn't sin this week, instead of I'm going to fight temptation no matter what because I love my Jesus. Imagine what you'll do. Imagine who you'll be in Jesus. Amen? Amen. So listen, if you wondering what the questions were, question four on every page. That's what the questions were. So let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your love, your grace, your mercy. We thank you there is none like you. We pray, Lord, that we will find our identity in you and nothing else. Not our pride, not our sin, not our shame, not our politics, not who we think we are, not who we were, but only in you, Christ Jesus. Help us to present our bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and honorable, pleasing unto God, that we may approve what is the perfect and pleasing will of God. 
Help us to hunger and thirst for righteousness, not for what we want. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right.